Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Super Fantify. This being a show, this being a show where I talk about TV shows that are of the supernatural, fantasy, and/or science fictional genre. For today's episode, I'm gonna talk about Reginald the Vampire, season two, episode eight. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. So we're picking up in the aftermath of last episode. Uh, we have Reggie. Uh, Nikki, Maurice, and Angela. I figured Angela was going to be there just because, once again, Angela wasn't in last episode, so I figured we'd find out this episode she got teleported here, too, because these are the vampires in our crew. Well, sadly, the ones that are still alive. So, it does... They they had their uh, thought that, like, the reason why they were there is because Balestro put them there. He's the only one powerful enough to, like, do something like that. I'm, I'm like, well, I mean, Abraham probably could, but, like, he's doing his own thing. So I don't think he, he put you here. But this kind of feels like it adds validity to my theory up until now. Like, Balestro is kind of like, this was all really a test. It's not really like, I'm really going to kill the vampire species. It's just a test. Or maybe he is, but it is like a, hey, you got to go to extremes just to force the vampire species to change. Show me that you are capable. So he's going to be like, yeah, this was a test. Either he's going to be like, I really was going to kill all of you. You failed, you know, being kind of like the arbiter and, you know, the judge, jury, and executioner of this all. Or he's going to be like, nah, I was never going to do it. I just needed you to believe uh, you needed your, your very existence to be threatened so you all would evolve and become better. It feels like it leads credence to that. Like I said, that all depends on if it was actually Blestro who was behind this. We don't actually know if he, because like Reggie's theory was kind of like, right, if he did this to us, that's most likely a byproduct of we like he's trying to stop us because we only like this is the last day. Like at midnight, we're dust. Well, well, hellfire, holy fire, and stuff like not hellfire, holy fire. So I don't know. He, he makes the most sense, but like I said, this could have been an Abraham thing too. But this episode's a lot about reflection in and a, and a lot of parts because Reggie is beating himself up because it's like, right, Sarah's gone. His attempt to try and bring her back didn't work. And he just, he feels like he's failing on all fronts. Maurice is trying to pep him up, be like, no, you're a hero. But for Reggie, it's just like he doesn't feel like he's a hero, which I think that's kind of the interesting parallel. If I remember correctly, the Abraham episode was uh, episode eight of season one, if I'm remembering correctly. So it's interesting that that was kind of like his hero journey. He was at like his low point and what that journey meant for him in season one. And now you kind of have him kind of doing that too, but more, um, more self-reflection in a lot of way, turning inward, trying to figure stuff out because he doesn't believe himself to be a hero, but we get reflection on a, on a lot of fronts because we, well, first and foremost, we find out Angela was literally about to stake herself before she popped up here. It's like, that's the only reason why she's still alive. It's like, that's sad. It's like, yeah, because even Maurice talks about it later on. It's like, wait, you would never go out like that. You'd always go out swinging. But for her, it's like, I've killed so many people. I've left so much death and destruction in my wake. Like, the fact of the matter is, it should only be fitting that the last body I drop be my own. Because, like, it is the thing that Angela made clear earlier in the season, too. The moment they found out about Balestro and she went on a killing spree. It's like... I'm the one who gets to determine how I go out of this world nowhere else. And it's just, it's like, that's that's extremely sad that she was kind of pushed to that corner. Because she'd rather go out on her own turns than be, like, killed by Balestro. But Maurice is like, no, you're the fighter. Like, you'd at least go out swinging, you know? Um, but yeah, like, circling back to Maurice really quickly. We find out he the night he met Reginald at the beginning of the series was not actually the first time they met. In fact, Maurice has actually fed off of Reginald. He, he ran into Reginald. He's like, yeah, fed on you like three times. He's like, dude, it's like, it's so funny that that never came up. It's like, yeah, I guess like near the end and especially how Reginald's like, like, you know, um, praising Maurice is like, yeah, like, you know, thanks to you, like, my life changed for the better and stuff, so I owe you a lot. I mean, yeah, I wasn't too keen on the whole being a creature in the night thing, but, you know, it benefited me in a lot of ways, so thank you. And he's like, well, I probably should come clean about the fact that I actually fed on you three times, and Reginald's like, I thought I had skin cancer, you know? So that's that's so interesting, like, expanding that lore of, like, yeah, they'd actually met each other before he turned them. I was like, that's so interesting. I also do love, like, staying on Reginald really quickly, that both him and Sarah parallel each other, where as, like, um, 
Reginald was thinking about the afterlife because him and Sarah had a conversation like a couple months, well, quite a few months back, talking about heaven. And obviously growing up in the religious family she did, she didn't really know whether she believed in heaven or Well, she actually said she doesn't. Uh, Reginald's like comes from a family that is spiritual, but they never really pushed that whole notion of like heaven and stuff. So he was kind of unclear on it. And, um, I, I love that. Like where it's just kind of like the whole, like Todd telling them and Ashley to like, right. Always be selling. You got to keep smiling, make the customer want to come back and get a second. God forbid it, God willing, a third slushy. So because I, at that point, because that was like nine months ago, and we find out Reginald started working at the Slushy Shack like 10 months ago, so it was like a month into him working there. Um, but yeah, my, my point too was also like how Sarah's memory was like, the memory she thought about was like the first time she met Reginald is when he came into like, because he was actually doing something for school, like for college, where it's like he was going to work there for, um, I don't think it was like a dissertation. I don't, I don't remember what it was. It was something he was like having to write for college. And it was like, yeah, I want to work here for a little bit. And Todd was initially like, no, we can't do that. But Sarah's like, no, nah, he's good. Uh, Kevin just quit. Remember, because after he threw that slushy at you, he was like, we don't have to talk about Kevin. I'm like, what happened with Kevin? What did Kev, What was the issue between Kevin and Todd? I was like, was there Kevin ever referenced last season? To be fair, this was like 10 months ago. So probably wouldn't have ever been really mentioned. But anyway, like, uh, I do like that, um, going back to the more recent Reggie conversation, Reginald's like, yeah, dude, like, we're good. Like, you're, you're my, you're my dad, friend, sire thing. So it's like, yeah, like, we're, we're always going to be good. I thought that was, that was neat. Angela and Maurice kind of look back on the past, like her, you know, you know, sometime after him turning and him being excited and so happy about like the prospect of being a vampire, like his life as a vampire and him and Angela kind of having forever, which he was so enticed by that, which, you know, Angela's like, right, for, don't forget forever is forever. Forever is a very long time, but he's so caught up in the moment. It's kind of sad knowing what their history eventually became. But I think it's also beautiful to see where they have come full circle to be kind of back where they were at the beginning, kind of young and in love before, you know, Angela kind of, you know, life has its way of kind of darkening you and everything. I mean, I, but obviously we've seen like Angela has changed more and more, especially this season. The moment she finds out, she not only found out about Mike, she also found out about Sarah. And Maurice is like, oh, were you fond of Sarah? It's like, no, but, you know, he, like, Reginald was. And it's like, yeah, she was his everything. And like, that's like, that once again, it's like, oh, look at you being so soft. You would never admit, but you, you like Reginald now. And even she says it later on, be like, yeah, if you, if you ever said anything, I would like not acknowledge it. It's like, she keeps doing that over and over, but she's definitely softened a lot towards Reggie. So, because they're all kind of thinking like, right, Reggie's going to be the one to save us. Like he's kind of been our key factor, but it's like, once again, Reginald's not feeling very much like a hero at this moment, and he doesn't know what to do. They even had, like, the Nikki conversation with him where she's like, right, you're you're the plan guy, so I believe in you. And, you know, Nikki talks about the fact is that, yeah, you know, obviously she found love, you know? And um, with Ashley, it's like, oh, yeah, like, Ashley's her hero because it's like, yeah, like... They were the first person, I think, like, Nikki's, like, absolutely fell in love with. And there's even that beautiful moment where it turns out, like, Todd and Ashley are outside of the slushy sack, but they can't get in. But then I was like, and then they kind of cut back and forth between that, whereas, like, Ashley's like, I know, I know that Nikki's in there. I was like, interesting. So the slushy shack, so they're not in some, they are in a pocket dimension, but basically the slushy shack has become a pseudo pocket dimension that they've been kind of locked in. So... Uh, Todd actually comes up with the idea of like sneaking in there and they're going through the air vents and Todd you know once again we've seen Todd's growth you know being a lot more in touch with his emotions and being a lot clearer about his feelings because he's kind of discovering and you know especially with everything with Mike he was like at first I didn't know if I like loved Mike or was I just you know caring for Mike because he was going to make me a vampire but he's like because of that whole situation with Mike I've kind of learned what I'm capable like that I can love and I, I, I know who I who I'm capable of loving and who I would want to love you know and it's like it was something it's something beautiful to see like how that character went from the tool bag that it could we get a little bit of it you know in the little flashback he's not as 
douchebaggy in these moments, but it's still like, yeah, that's who Todd was in season one, and to see how much he's grown and changed and kind of let go a lot of his toxic traits. Um, but then later on, there's the whole situation with Ashley, who they learned how to love because they didn't think it was possible either. But it's like, yeah, the first time I heard like Nikki sing to me, and it's like it, it became clear because you know, as we've talked, as Ashley talked about it like last episode, Ashley was like, yeah, I always get inside my own head, and I just I don't doesn't think it was possible. Ashley's perspective was like, yeah, the person, the perfect person for me, I thought was going to be like someone from a different dimension. Cause it's like, I'm a little different. I didn't think there was going to be anyone in this world who can kind of really, I can kind of connect with, but it's like, yeah, they're both oddballs in their own ways. Like, and their odd, their oddness and their oddities kind of complement each other really nicely. So it's just really beautiful. I mean, I mean, especially when you put that in conjunction with the scene of like Nikki, the black and white singing to Ashley and like how like, Oh, Ashley makes them feel. Which saying Ashley so much, and obviously in the reference of a song, makes me think of the Escape the Fate song, Ashley, which I haven't heard in so long. I also have an ex named Ashley, so I don't know, I'm just like correlating so many different like, um, ugh, synapses in my head are popping off. Just like correlating, connecting so much stuff that it's like, oh, like, either, either way, it just, just wants to get an insight into my brain sometimes. But yeah, there's also the whole, um, Angela and Reginald conversation like I said she was like being like right I would never acknowledge it to anyone else but you know sh she's happy like she's once again softened up a lot, a lot more basically that Maurice has someone it's like right I want you to be there for him with, when it's all over and I'm like Angela it's like right it's like Angela's planning on taking herself out of the equation but uh, Maurice stops her. It's like, no, no, no. If you're going to go, then you have to take me with you because you're going to have to kill me first because that's the only way you're going to take yourself out of this world because if you go, we're going together. And she's like, can't you just like let me walk this like path along? And he was like, no, I can't. So go ahead and do it. And she throws the stake at the wall and it cracks. I thought that was going to be a point of like, oh, should we go over there to the wall and like punch it and see if we can make our way through? It's like, no, it, just, it was just for the dramatic purposes of how hard she threw it. But it's just, it leads to them making out. So I was like, okay, so, I mean, they'd already been sleeping together. It already kind of rekindled stuff already. But I think this was kind of the extra push they needed. Especially because it's like, right, we're, we're down to the wire. The fact that the matter is, like, our, our time is clicking away. And it's like all this reflection and reflecting everyone's done in this moment. You know, it's, it's, it's really beautiful. And especially at the end where... Um, they're playing Never Have I Ever, and just like it's actually really adorable, all of them around the table. And it gets Reggie reflecting, where it's just kind of he's looking at everything around him. And it's like those who aren't there with them right now, like Ashley or um, Todd or Mike and Sarah and Claire. And it's just kind of a reminder of the circle he has. Like, And he talks about that. He's like, right, you guys are the reason why. Uh, it kind of gives me the same, if you've ever, slight spoilers, but not really, I won't go into details. It makes me think about the Noctis speech. Like, at the very, very end of Final Fantasy XV, there's a scene with Noctis, and he says some stuff, and you're like, oh, shit, you guys, you're the best, you know? And it's just, that scene, it makes me, it gives me that same energy, and you just kind of like, you almost, you see Reggie almost want to cry, because it's just like, right, you guys have given me so much more, like, my life has expanded so much because of you guys, like, like, he kind of just lived his life to himself, because we don't really know too much about Reggie prior to, like, the beginning of the series, but, you know, his infatuation with Sarah, he had Claire as a friend, but, like, his circle has grown so much because of the people in his lives, and it's just, he's like, that's what makes me a hero, like, that's what it means to be a hero, he, you know, it's like protecting those that you, you care about, and it's just, especially those who've kind of it's like having each other's backs. Like it, it, for him, it's kind of like right. Being a hero isn't like a solo thing. Like it takes it takes a village type of situation, and it just it was like this really beautiful sentimental moment. And just at the same time, that's all happening. Todd and Ashley crash down from the ceiling, and it kind of breaks whatever spell kind of kept them like in a pocket dimension. And the doors fling open, and Reginald's like, right. I think I this this is what we, we're ready for this fight. Don't really like. It's the cornerstone of his plan, which I love that it's like, 
Maurice was like, oh, Gandhi? He was like, actually, Jay-Z, but still, the point remains. You know, it's like, this whole, we've got each other's back is going to be the cornerstone of this. What that entails necessarily, who knows? Just, he tells Todd and um, Ashley to bring Claire. It's like, um, Altus will know where. So, I'm curious where the final showdown is going to happen. Well, because Reginald did get shown, like, back in the Abraham episode... Uh, two episodes back about what was going to go down, where it was supposed, where he's supposed to meet his end. So I wonder why would he know? Well, I guess Altus would be able to, as a supernatural, as an incubus, he'd be able to sense the whole because they're drawn to where they need to go because it's like right, uh, Angel Radar is kind of kicking in and drawing us there. So I guess as a supernatural, Altus would feel it too. I wonder why Claire wouldn't. I guess, like, because because Claire's half-human, maybe it wouldn't register. We, once again, we still don't know what her part in all this will be, so we'll have to wait to see. So, we have that. And then there's also, uh, as I touched on a little bit, the Sarah side of things, where she's listening to this recording. But I think it's interesting, it speaks volumes, that she no longer hears the voice. Like, at first it seemed like she needs the headset and everything to hear it, but it's like, no, she eventually... Um, is able just to hear the voice on its own, but it's like, hey, this is heaven. So it's like, interesting. So it's not even purgatory. It's supposed to be heaven, but I think that's interesting that Mike is there, which I think maybe speaks volumes about vampires, where it's like, okay, so even vampires can be welcomed into heaven. So, because I thought we might get an, um, Sarah and Mike running into each other type of situation. Who knows? But cause we haven't cut back to Mike since the episode he died and everything. Yeah, because that was two episodes ago, because that was when they were uh, dealing with the Abraham situation. But it, my point is that kind of goes into, like, the whole Uriel and Balestro kind of treating vampires like they're monsters. It's like, but they were monsters, how would they find their way into heaven, if that is what this really is? Because Sarah, she almost is able to contact Reginald for a little bit, but couldn't fully go through. So... She's trying to find answers. It's like, right, if there is some God, I'm going to try and find him and try and get some answers, you know? And she goes through the gift shop and sees a bright light. I was like, yeah, there's not enough time in this episode. There's no way we're going to get a resolution to what this is. So maybe we'll get it next episode. There's only two episodes left in this season, so I'm so, which does beg the question. It's like, okay, so what's going to happen in these next two episodes? They're about to go off and face Balestro now, and it's only episode nine. So... I'd assume the Sarah stuff is going to play a key role in this. Obviously, Claire as well. But in what roles? Once again, the Mike stuff. Like, are we going to see him and Claire run? Like, what did Claire... Like, did Claire run into God? And you're going to tell him about Uriel? And it's like, right, humans are supposed to... That was also the thing, too, for, for Reginald, was bringing up the point that they were told, like, right, uh, a key factor in all of this is, despite being vampires, they still have free will, which is something the angels really don't. So I don't know if like God's kind of letting the angels do their thing. It's like, right, I kind of let, they have to, they kind of have pseudo free will of their own. Maybe that's what this is supposed to be a lesson for the angels to learn to have free will and not just, I, I don't know. I don't know what to fully make of all of this. We'll ultimately have to wait to see what the next episode has in store for us with all of this. But really, that's all I want to talk about. Till the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and goodbye.